command. Ah, start, yeah. Добрый вечер, дорогие друзья. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anastasia Mityushina. I am the curator of the public program of the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art. And today we have a big event. We're introducing and presenting the book by Andrei Lepecki, Exhausting Dance. And we are happy to have the author with us here. Andrei Lepecki is a researcher of contemporary dance, a curator and a professor and head of department of performance studies. New York University. His book, Exhausting Dance, was first published for 15 years ago, and only several months ago its Russian translation was published. We are happy because this is a big epochal book, almost a textbook for the area, and we're happy to discuss it with Andre. Uh, the agenda is the following. Andre will be giving an overview for 30 or 40 minutes how this book came to be, and the methods he used, and uh, whether some ideas have uh, regained or lost their relevance. And we also have Anna Kazonina with us, joining from Helsinki, and she'll be asking questions to Andre. and we're also inviting the viewers of the uh, broadcast to ask their questions. Anna Kazonina is a researcher of contemporary dance, currently studying to be a curator of contemporary dance, and recently she published a book at our publishing house called Strange Dancing, which deals with contemporary dance in Russia in the two last decades. This is our company for today. Now it's over to you. Thank you very much for joining us from the very, like, rather early morning in New York, a midday already. Uh, so please share with us uh, if you're happy <laughs> that there is a Russian version now and uh, also how you worked on the book and how some of ideas are changed are still relevant and then we ask questions. Thanks. Sure. Um, I think it's good night or good evening in uh, in Russia right now. Um, here in the, is in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, Nastya, Anna, uh, the entire team at Garage, the translators, it's really a pleasure to be here, it's a great honor. Um, and it's, yes, I'm very happy for one more language for exhausting dance. Um, so yes, so, you know, the request was to see if I could speak a little bit about the book, um, what brought the book into, into being at that moment. Uh, the book was written throughout the year 2005 and reflecting on dances that uh, were happening mostly maybe f the decade before. Um, but let me preface uh, with the word method. <laughs> Nastya brought that word up, um, and I think it's important. So, so I think it is important to say that exhausting dance comes from at least a decade, the decade before of the book has been written, actually 15 years before, I had been working as a dance dramaturg, uh, first of all in Lisbon with a group of choreographers, um, Vera Mantero, Francisco Camacho and João Fiadeiro. <coughs> and Vera actually appears in a chapter of the book um, but throughout the 90s, working with Meg Stewart. And I mention this because uh, I'm my, I was trained to be a cultural anthropologist, and I never thought that I would end up working with dancers, choreographers, and contemporary dance. Also because I'm a horrible dancer, I can't dance at all. Which I think it is interesting because methodologically, something happened in my trajectory, intellectual trajectory in cultural anthropology towards becoming someone ex specialized in performance studies, but particularly dance studies, that informs the method that is behind the writing of exhausting dance. 
And that was the fact that even though I don't dance and I'm not trained in aesthetics or dance history or anything like that, regardless of that lack of training, there were that group of dancers and choreographers that I just mentioned, including, very importantly for me, Meg Stewart, uh, nevertheless invited me to be part of their process of creation. So it is a kind of a, as a kind of foreign or alien body to the practices of dance that nevertheless I was invited by dancers and by choreographers to participate in their process of creation. And that kind of request was interesting. Now looking back historically, I think, it's an interesting request because it shows something that I think Exhausting Dance tries to do, which is this moment in the 1980s, but particularly throughout the entire 1990s, in which the distinction between dancing and choreographing becomes a real issue for this generation of experimental dancers. There is a fundamental difference between dancing and choreographing. And what I think became very, very important for the group of artists that I talk about in, or write about in Exhausting Dance is what is the what are the, what are the constitutive elements of the choreographic dispositive? Okay? And particularly, what is the figure of function of the choreographer as an author in that space? So that would be the first thing. And I think that that generation of dancers and choreographers that invited me to be part of the process as a dramaturg I didn't know I was a dramaturg, by the way, also. <coughs> we had no name for my function. And we only, I only became a dramaturg. There was a, performa there was a performative speech act that was performed by Bruno Verbergt, who was the, the director of the festival Klapstuk in Belgium in the, in the, in the early 90s. Uh, they, de they had to justify my salary f for working with Meg Stewart and we had no name for what I was doing and he said, oh, you're the dramaturg. I was like, oh, okay, very happy to be the dramaturg even though I don't know what that is. But in that space of not knowing, necessarily a method had to come through. Now, what is going on also at that period in the 90s? And I remember like, this was very, very present, was that there was a kind of ethical refusal to move about like crazy. Um, and I remember Vera Montero articulating that very, very clearly in Paris in the, in the late 90s, um, when um, in a gathering of choreographers that was uh, happening skit, it was uh, Jean-Marc Adolphe who put these choreographers together. Um, and many of them were doing still dances, dances that refused to demonstrate on stage a kind of hyper virtuosity of the dancer. So really long moments of almost nothing happening on stage. That was for me an interesting kind of refusal it was a refusal to participate in a certain regime of dance that had imposed to this art form that it had constantly to, de to display in on stage movement without stopping, a kind, of, a kind of endless demonstration of the capacity to move. Now, when these dancers and choreographers, Mag, Jérôme Bell, Vera Mantero, Xavier uh, Roy, Larry Bott, like all of these appear somehow in, in Exhausting Dance. When they suspended that, that, that pressure to move and to display movement, something really interesting happened at the level of the, the cr critics, at the level of the producers, and at the level of the public. I, I witnessed with his own eyes the public rioting, just like in Nijinsky, you know, like the Rite of Spring, this 100 years later, rioting because 
they were not moving. They meaning the dancers. And I remember like audience members walking to the stage in pieces by Jerome Bell saying, dance, where is Jerome? Why doesn't he dance? Or with Vera Mantero, or with uh, audience member throwing coins at pieces by Meg Stewart because they were not moving. This, this really happened. So that was very, and at the same time, the critics, and this is the beginning of Exhausting Dance, I start Exhausting Dance by, by narrating a dance review by one of the main critics of the New York Times at the time, um, in the dance review in 2000 saying, if this continues, and she's talking about William Forsythe, which is a completely different generation, like, <laughs> if this continues, dance is going to disappear. And that was really, really interesting. How is it that I knew that these dancers and choreographers did not want dance to disappear. They just wanted to, a certain image or modality of making dance to be interrogated in its premises, right? So the book starts exhausting dance then, that word exhausting, which in certain languages is hard to translate, um, has the exhausting dance. One has to exhaust dance, but also the dance, because the dance that we're doing right now is exhausting, you know, it doesn't give us any joy. You know, we need a different kind of dance. So we need to exhaust a certain dance that exhausts us in order so another kind of dance can emerge. Yeah, in, in Russian we uh, like this exhaustion of the viewer or of the dance itself. So, so, mm -hmm. so it's more like, um, you're like melting out the dance or something like this. So it's only about the definition. Nice. Okay. So, <laughs> and now in translation, I'm sure it's still happening the same thing. So, so, so I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how can I, in a way, defend my friends? How can I be a lawyer or an advocate for these dancers that were doing this incredible work, but were not being necessarily heard or being depicted as betrayers or enfant terribles, even though they're like very nice people and they just want to do something, <laughs> something that is worth having, you know. Um, and a book came up that was important for me, and I mentioned this in the introduction of the, of the book, which is a book by the psychoanalyst, feminist psychoanalyst Teresa Brennan, who passed away in the early 2000s. She has a book called Exhausting Modernity. And I mentioned in the introduction of the book that the title is directly related to her book. And she said, we need to exhaust a certain notion of modernity because modernity is a project that exhausts us. And that for me was a click because <laughs> the project of modernity is a kinetic project. It's a project of construction of properly constituted subjects for movement, right? And this is uh, Peter Sloterdijk's insight in this uh, book, uh, Euro Taoismus, right? Which is to think that there's a secret to modernity, which is a kinetic unconscious to modernity. And that for me was very, very important because all of a sudden with the notion of modernity, I could realize that um, perhaps the only art form that modernity actually invented was an art form made to capture movement, which is called choreography. And if, and if sen cinematography, <laughs> kinema, cinema, is the, same, is the same art form, it just came with a different technology, but it's the same thing, you know, let's, let's capture the kinetic, like it's with film, but, but before the technology of film, we have choreography. So there's something that happens in Exhausting Dance that I would like to call attention to, which is, it is a book that even though it's talking about mostly choreographers, but also a few visual artists that use choreography to, to, for their work, um, namely Bruce Nauman and William Popel, they appear very importantly in the book. Um, even though it is a book about about these th these generations that you just mentioned last year and um, and uh, and the um, of the, the so-called conceptual dancers, which it's a word that I I've never used that expression. I don't use it. It's not, it doesn't appear in the book. 
uh, I refuse its <laughs> its operational value, uh, except for a discussion that we can have later about it. But so even though it is a book about this period, it was important for me to start the book going back to the kind of historical foundation of the choreographic imagination. And in that sense, maybe I'll just share some images because it becomes less boring for the, for the public, but also becomes, I think, interesting for us to take a look. Hopefully this will appear. In the book, even though I'm writing about dances of the 2000s, this book is very, very, very important, Orchestrography, because something that happens in this, in Exhausting Dance, I'm trying to understand how is it that the foundation of choreography creates a kind of long durational um, impetus for the Western understanding of dance that is so ingrained as to become quasi ontological. You see, it's almost ontological. And one of the things that happens in this book, I think it's very, very important, is that it's the first time that this word is, so orchesis is the movement of the choir, like graphi is the writing of the movement of the choir, so it's the first version of the word choreography. By Arbo in 1589, 1589, right, at the end of the 16th century. So what happens in this book for me is interesting because it's a dialogue between two men. It's important to gender here. One is a dancer who's a lawyer, dancer-lawyer, male, who's going to meet with a judge who's also a bishop, who's also a choreographer. Okay. So we have all the functions, and a mathematician. So we have all these functions, mathematician, um, lawyer, judge, bishop, <laughs> right? All these males who talk to each other and try to understand the art of dance. And one of the, Capriol is the lawyer, mathematician, dancer. And he says, so dance master, judge, Arbo, why is it that dance is considered a low art form? And the dance master says, and this, he says something that Peggy Phelan would say in 1993, the, the performance studies theoretician. He says, because dance disappears. It is ephemeral. It doesn't stick around. <laughs> and then the lawyer, the lawyer, mathematician, dancer, says, Master, does n do not allow this to happen. Write a book so that in the isolation of my chambers, when you and your companions of youth are no longer with us, in other words, you are dead, I can open the book and dance with them, dance with you. Now, this is a Derridian, <laughs> a Jacques Derrida machine of writing. Écriture as a kind of hauntology. This is, but, but this is not like me coming up with this. It's there. It's in the book. You read it. There's a dancer who's a lawyer who says, in order for dance not to disappear, we have to put it down in writing so that then we can dance with those who are no longer with us, with, with the dead. We have to, how to dance with the dead. How to create an afterlife for dance choreographically. Now, this is super, super important because it generates then uh, a kind of understanding of dance that um, would allow us later on <laughs> to think about Bruce Nauman, right? And to think about Bruce Nauman answering to the call of, of how to dance, not only through this notion of being in the isolation of the chamber, but look what's going on. The other version of the word choreography that appears later, that now it's the, the word choreography, 1700, by Raoul Auger Foyer, under the auspices of Louis XIV, doesn't put, 
you know, so it's choreography. So it should be bodies, right? The first concern of this book should be bodies, but it's not. The first concern of this book is to create, this is the second page of the book. You open the book that says choreography, and the first thing that appears is, oh, let me put this bigger, I'm sorry, is de la salle of the room or theater. That's the first thing that needs to be defined by the choreographer. In other words, in order for dance to become choreographed, it has to be put into conf a state of confinement. It has to be extracted from the social realm. This is the room of dance. This, th th excuse me. This is the room of choreography, and this is where the presence of the body takes place. This is the body for foyer. <laughs> it has no gender. It has no age. It has no race. It has no flesh. It has no psychological life. It's a generic inscribed body of, l of language. This is the function of choreography, to track bodies. This is the body. This is the body of Jerome Bell in Jerome Bell, 1995. It's, it's, it's something else. This is the body of Tamiris Costa. This is the body <laughs> of Foyer. This is the body of two Brazilian contemporary choreographers, David Pontes and Wallace Ferreira. Right? And they are not. And so, so you have like this kind of, you have this square, this 18th century square of choreography, all of a sudden appears on the floor of Bruce Nauman in 1969. This is, a, this is what Didier Huberman recovering Abby Warburg would call a surviving image. And I know that Bruce Nauman didn't go to Foyer to read this thing. And look, there's even a mirror, and there's an empty bench. Why is it that this empty bench is there? Because every time there is a dancer moving around within the choreographic regime, there will be a ghost. I have no question about it. And that ghostly matter is something that informs the entire first chapter of the book is to, to think about this relationship between dance, ghostly matters, and a kind of melancholy of, of Western choreography. And it is important to talk about this because it is precisely this melancholy that I feel that becomes um, interrogated through the works of the, wor of the other artists that I talk about in the book. I don't want to take too long, but very quickly, you know, like when this is a, f a fundamental piece for the whole book, which is the work of Jerome Bell, right? So what happens in Jerome Bell is precisely, I think, in, in my mind, if we need to exhaust a certain idea of dance that compels dancers to be moving all the time, then we need to find a degree zero, and this is an expression that Jerome uses in several interviews when he talks about his dance of this period, <coughs> a degree zero of dance. And this piece was absolutely transformative, um, Jerome Bell by Jerome mm -hmm. Bell, in which, just very quickly, you are in the theater, and the theater has no light design, no sound, no number. So the dancer walks, a dancer walks into the room with a light bulb connected, you can see that. And this light bulb is the only th light design. So the first condition of possibility for choreography to appear is, as um, Malarmé would say, it's the chandelier, <laughs> it's the light. Yeah, there is also one uh, issue of appearing and disappearing. My colleagues say that if we keep this image too long, we will we'll be kicked off the translation by YouTube. Ah, <laughs> and this too? Uh, might be, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going back to square. Oh, because it's naked people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll okay. pick the naked people. There's naked people and then the, the no longer naked people. Yeah, definitely. It's just while you're talking so that we can share them for sec several seconds, but not keeping too long because otherwise uh oh goodness. Off. Yeah. the algorithm the al so okay so this is for the second half of the conversation 
how is it that the choreographic remains relevant? Because choreography is the moment in which the disciplinary, the transition from the sovereign state to disciplinary societies into control societies carries the same and exact project, which is to track movement. Why? Because movement has been relegated from the sphere of the theological. God was the one who was responsible for the movement of celestial and sublunar bodies into something that is delegated to the individual as the image of their freedom. And if it is the movement of freedom means the freedom at large, of course it becomes the business of power to manage it. So that's just a... So, so, so anyway, so so I don't even know like if this is about exhausting dance anymore, but the question of stillness was very, very, very important. The question here... Here I show something also that happens with the work of La Ribot, which was one of the operations to break away from the choreographic regime, which is that predicated the condition of possibility as we saw it's even before defining a body, you have to define the space in which a body will take place. In other words, the space, the confinement defines the body that should be dancing, which is a confined body. Right? Laribot talked specifically about her wish to break away from the theater and go into other spaces. <coughs> and what I find interesting is that in this image particularly, you know, like being side by side with the audience member, people sitting, the dancer sitting, this, and in the end she'll be lying down next to these things, so to become thing among things, I think is an interesting operation. So, um, and I found uh, a kind of, I'm sorry for the quality of the images taken from a video, um, it should be better quality. This is Trisha Brown. Um, stepping up f after completing one of her drawings on the f on the on the ground, so to draw on the ground, to top to topple the vertical plane of representation, this kind of operation. So the, the entire book is looking at these operations that um, exhaust dance in order for a non-exhausting dance to appear, and it, they're all made by choreographers and dancers. These operations. Um, Another important concept uh, that happens, and I'll just finish quickly because then we can start the conversation. <coughs> One of the visual artists that is very, very important in the book, and I don't know if visual artist is the right word to define the work of William Popel, visual performance artist. William Popel starts doing these crawlings in the 90s. Um, this is a Tom Tompkins Square Park um, crawl. So William Popel, uh, as a black body in the Americas, crawling in the streets. And for me, like in the text that I, about William Popel, what I try to do always is a kind of way of thinking, how is it that um, certain kind of critical theory and pho political philosophy in itself mobilizes movement and action in order to allow for us to read the moments that we are in. So, what I try to do in the chapter on William Popel is to think about how is it that William Popel's work is in dialogue with the work of Franz Fanon from the 1950s, so there's always like, in the book is haunted constantly by a time that is out of hinge, it's non-chronological, it's something that happens in the book that is, time keeps coming back and forth. Um, so it's not only in conversation with Fran Franz Fanon, but how is it that Franz Fanon is also establishing um, a completely different possibility for philosophy to take place. Um, so, Fanon in the in um, Black Skins White Masks 
narrates the moment in which he's walking in the streets of Lyon in France as a young doctor, a bourgeois man who had fought in the French army in the Second World War and a doctor, psychiatrist, so properly constituted subject. And he listens a sentence. It is, Mommy, a Negro, I'm afraid. And when he listens to that, he narrates that he stumbles and falls. So what I find interesting here is that a speech act uttered by a child, right, um, creates a kind of private earthquake. <laughs> it literally transforms the ground under the feet of Fanon so that he falls. And then that made me think about the relationship between ground or soil, surface, and movement. Because coming back to that surface, the privileged surface of dance after the invention of choreography has been this, the, the smooth terrain without accidents. But we know that that's an illusion. That's an that's a illusion of, mod of modernism, of modernity. Because every ground is filled with grooves and accidents. And those accidents can be physical, but they, can also, can they, they also can be induced by language. Right? So this is the chapter that I have on William Popel and on the work of Vera Mantero. Um, Vera Mantero does a piece based on the work of Josephine Baker. And in that piece, she is constantly in a state of almost falling, even though she doesn't, she doesn't dislocate in the stage. She's, she's on one spot on the stage, <coughs> but she's on um, goat's hooves, like the hooves of goat, which goes back to Capriol, the dancer who in the 16th century asks choreography to be invented. And she seems to be almost always falling Right? in this kind of interpolation of, of blackness uh, also. Right? And there's something about, even though the, f the terrain is flat, it's as if her movement indicates that the, that the flat terrain of modernity is filled of improperly buried bodies whose bones are sticking out from the earth and constantly make us be off balance. Um, and that's more or less the overarching view of the whole book in, in, in a very quick and I'm sure exhausting description. Um, I don't know if this... I think it's intriguing. <laughs> And uh, but the que and so there is still a question which we were trying to raise up also. Like after 15 years, uh, what do you think now is like whether most relevant to you personally in your teaching or in your curatorial career? What of these concepts? Or yeah. do you see that all this um, <coughs> will like take these uh, figures of the artists and uh, choreographers that you describe in the book? Uh, or do you see a mix of it, or like if you're some of the interest shifted, or could you please share? I mean, like I think there's two. There's there's at least one thing that I that I think that I know it's still relevant, and I'm I'm proud of that actually. Two weeks ago, I got an email from choreographers that I have no idea who they are, never met them before, and and they just decided to write to me from Brazil because something happened to them that I also describe in the book that happened with Jerome Bell. Jerome Bell was prosecuted in Ireland <laughs> yeah, yeah. by a member of the audience because this member of the audience said, this is absurd, this is not dance. So he went to court. Yeah, yeah, so the law is always, right? Remember that? Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. And we can right? So these two, these two men, I don't know, they, they say, hey, I just wanted to thank you because we were prosecuted by the Brazilian government because they received federal funds to do dance and they did like these pieces. I don't even know what they are. And they were prosecuted 
severely by the state saying they had misused public monies and they used exhausting dance to, as, as, as a document for their defense. Oh my God. So the, the book came to, so I'm sh so if this happened 2021, so 15 years later, this, this demand for dance to be always performing according to its hegemonic image of perpetual movement exists. So that for sure is still working. I but think I think in Russia as well. I'm sorry, in Russia? Okay. I think in Russia, like mostly a uh, common understanding of what is dance or contemporary dance, I think it's still relevant. I don't know if any confirms or not, but I think this is what she tries also to somehow expand mm -hmm. in her yeah. uh, strange dances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing I feel, so therefore, the still act remains fundamental and in an age 15 years later what is it that we have we have the domination of the planet and now it's called meta but but facebook right and i keep thinking about the relationship between facebook and movement it seems not to have a relationship but it does what is the what is the motto what is the the the, the order word that mark zuckerberg came up to define the ethos of Facebook. Move fast and break things. Oh, now, right. yes, move fast and break things was in the in the it's in it's there in, in, in their offices. Okay, move fast and break things. Moving fast and breaking things is another word for white expansionism. White capitalistic <laughs> expansionism keeps moving fast and breaking things as much as possible. It doesn't, it doesn't care. And it will not slow down. So there's something that I still believe that the still act, which I define in the it's a concept from a Greek anthropologist, Nadia Serematakis, it's very important in the book. I think the still act still operates. What has changed, nevertheless, is the way in which the definition of being for movement that is so important in throughout the whole book this kind of kinetic being is now which therefore is still like a being of muscle and and tendons and flesh and bone is now being tracked by surveillance capitalism through um, well, in other words, what really matters now is the parasympathetic system, <laughs> is the somatic. And that's why, like, in a way, you know, a few years after the publication of Exhausting Dance, you know, the, the moment in which, like, the notion of choreography expands to its limit, you know, there's a, there's a lot of effort to expand the notion of the choreographic in an expanded field, but around 2010, 2012, there's, that effort starts to, to, to transform and flourish into a prominence of the dancing body once again, dancing like crazy. <laughs> and now I think it's possible, now meaning for the past 10 years, I think it is possible and necessary and urgent to dance like crazy. Dance, 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 dance as a kind of fugitivity. You know. Anyway, so that I don't know if it answers uh, last yeah. year. Yeah. No. No. I think it's like. Uh, I mean, surely it's hard to compare this uh, amount of timing. So, I mean, the nineties. I was too young, and I as well. And I, I, Anya, I will ask the last question, and then I will pass to you, and I can cover up then at the end. Uh, I was also wond uh, wondering because you mentioned that you were a dramat dramaturgist. Even you didn't know uh, that it was called that that time, uh, so it was respectively. Uh, but I'm interested. What exactly did you do? I mean, did you influence their how the score developed, or were you a kind of a dialogue friend to a choreographer to an artist who put the work? Because I'm, it's interesting how that uh, it influences your method. So if you can share about that, <laughs> certainly. So what I many things. Um, from, hmm, I've, I've written about this, and it, this, this will be a long, long conversation, but very quickly. 
I don't think there's a method of dramaturgy in dance. I think every work demands something from the dramaturg. Every, sing every single work from, a very s from the same choreographer will demand a different thing. So, you know, in some works, I've, um, yeah, suggested scenes, for instance. In other works, we just sit next to the choreographer, just like um, uh, Pina Bausch, you know, we do like we have like the dramaturg next to her, like just talking to each other. Uh, some, sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes suggesting scenes. Sometimes bringing, uh, co having conversations with the dancers. Sometimes being a material. It depends. But what is really really interesting is to, the work of the dramaturg, makes you understand one thing. That no one really knows, what the work will be. Not even the choreographer. <laughs> No one knows. And this not knowing, it's super, super interesting space to inhabit. The dancers don't know exactly. The dramaturg definitely doesn't know exactly. The choreographer doesn't know exactly. But there's a knowing being made. There's a collective intellect being developed in the process of making a dance that each one has a particular role. And it is that amalgamation of knowledges and, and, and modes of being that actually allow in the end for the for the end product to exist. So the process of dramaturgy, I think is a super interesting thing. And sometimes the dancers would hate my presence because I don't dance. I remember there was <laughs> I remember there was a piece by Meg that she was commissioned by Barishnikov. And and Barishnikov was dancing in the piece. And there was a moment, I'm just gonna say uh, this is horrible I Okay, I'm just going to say it. It's going to be in YouTube. There was a moment that Meg was like, I don't think he's doing it right. <laughs> but who's going to tell Barishnikov that he's not doing it right? Who's going to say that ever to Barishnikov? So, you know, so there I was like trying to negotiate with Misha. Like, okay, so, you know, maybe, you know. So the dramaturg is like a nurse, a psychotherapist, uh, an editor, you know, a confidant. Okay, that's important. So, and then from this position, you switch to the writing of the book. Because it's like. Yeah, I was already writing about dance at the same time. I, I always wrote about dance as a critic and uh, all of this. Always combining the, the someone who is from, from inside. Yeah, because. The create the collective knowing, yeah. and on the other hand, looking yeah. to the outside. So it's like yes, but I, th that's very important, Nastya. That's very important to say because there is a premise in Western epistemology that in order for someone to be objective, one has to be distant. What I learn in dramaturgy is that the more close I was, the, the more proximity I had to the process, the more objective I could be, actually. And I really, really believe in that. And I think that's an important component for thinking about, you know, theories and methods in performance theory and dance studies and all of that, it is to think about what are the epistemologies of proximity? What is it that proximity allows us to know objectively? You know? So I think the book also maybe reflect that. Yeah, I think, yeah because the method is like, it's like always getting like very, very close from inside and like uh, structuring the work and then getting very far away like to philosophy. And, and uh, this is, this scope is astonishing. So it's like really, um. Yeah, but you see, the, all the philo I never, you know, I only start reading philosophy because all the choreographers that I worked with were reading really, were reading philosophy. So philosophy was coming from within the process. I have to say that mm -hmm. it's super important. Like I only the first time I ever read the Luz, it was because Vera Montero was reading the Luz. <laughs> I would never touch it. <laughs> so it's imminent. See. So where is the outside? That's what makes dance so interesting. Yes, this particular that, generation that, of dancers. 
that's maybe uh, the enigma of uh, your work because from some moments it, it's uh, when the book is being read so it seems that it's like how can you combine all this like philosophical things that so oh, that close but may then maybe you share if it goes from inside so that why, why it's happening because there is a feeling of very natural uh, connections I mean to me though I'm not like big specialist in philosophy but it seems that all the uh, interpretations that they are really opening up uh, the art piece you describe so it's like really natural but then going so far so it's like at some point you're like oh my god how I get there but then it's like really connected Anya I'm passing to you because I think I'm so talkative please join yeah as usual <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> yeah. I, I think it is a compliment <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for yeah for for this uh, introduction and like sharing some ideas about the book. I maybe would go a little bit into the problems, <laughs> the key concepts of of the book to discuss a little bit more how it is after these fifteen years. And I had a question. I think you tackled it a little bit already, talking about uh, Facebook and algorithms. And I was thinking, how would this concept of politics of movement or the access accents uh, and emphasis emphasis uh, in your book would be today? if you had to uh, write about politics of movement today, because like this the movement appears in the book in different uh, situations and it's like the kinetic imperative of modernity, but also it's this flickering between absence and presence. It's mm -hmm. also something which uh, for which the uncanny uh, manifests mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, Exhausting Dance is like is a book which is more concentrated on the issues of representation and subjectivity and how it's not uh, present <laughs> as present as it seems to be and um, maybe for me it's like a, a central problem here and if but the politics of movement is of course a like a bigger topic especially now uh, with the development of the algorithms and well, like with the development of different techniques of the society of control, which you mentioned already in your comments, uh, this tracking techniques. And now I'm recalling also uh, how Brian Masumi put it in his book, Politics of Affect, that actually the systems of control don't care what actually person you are now. So they do not care about your subjectivity, but they are tracking your movement. And like the way the control is imposed is through checking in actually and checking the movement and also like the discourse around logistics and infrastructures have developed in uh, cultural studies and arts in dance maybe also so mm -hmm. if you were to uh yeah to touch this concept of movement now through the yeah through through, through political perspective and maybe mm -hmm. how it's related to choreography and dance what would be the focus today after after these 15 years and like yeah Thank you, Anna. It's an um, amazing and, and question that I tried to answer. <coughs> I think actually um, I'll start with the pandemic, actually. Um, I, so, and I, I tell you what happened. I live between, my personal life happens between the United States and Brazil. So I'm, I'm less and less in Europe and more and more in the this, the Americas, North and South. Um, so, at, and which means that during the beginning of the cor uh, coronavirus pandemic, um, that also happened under Trump and Donald Trump and Bolsonaro, very specific regimes. And what's interesting in relationship to that is that it was very, very clear that a discourse was created that it is more important for the economy to keep moving than to save lives <laughs> okay and therefore the movement of economy the movement of goods and things and people should remain no matter what cost and then the question of confinement 
became very, very interesting because at least here in the Americas, in these two countries that I can talk of, and I don't want to talk about any other country, what happened was that the conservative and extreme right-wing movements pick up the question of freedom and said, we don't want to be confined, we want to be moving about. <laughs> and the demonstrations in Brazil that happened during the highest lockdowns were demonstrations in which people in their cars would walk, would drive around, and motorbikes would drive around the cities honking and saying freedom, freedom, freedom. This is super, super interesting because it demonstrates that we are now in a different regime of the kinetic. There's a relationship always between the kinetic and the living. Now there's a relationship between the kinetic and the dying in a kind of suicidal, genocidal gesture in which you understand finally that once the subject of the state has a little bit of a suspension, just like, just like you know, Jerome Bell of, of Vera Montero suspending a little bit the movement, it becomes an intolerable spectacle. But now it's an intolerable spectacle at the level of subjectivity. And here I would disagree a little bit with Brian Masumi because that, the, the, that essay on affect, it's also 15 or 16 years old. And it is true that at the time, societies of control just checking where you are in this kind of logisticality. Like just like, let's just track and see, you know, but I don't care who you are, but I just want to check where you are. <laughs> now with surveillance capitalism, this amazing book by Shoshana Zuboff, where she demonstrates that what Facebook has been doing, so what they do is that they capture affect. They are able to monitor through your postings how is it that you're feeling and they create these algorithms of, of emotion for certain populations and they can track that, okay, the population now between 15 and 18 years of age is going through a moment in the week that they're all more or less depressed, so this is the advertising that they need. <laughs> and through that they can reinforce also the, f the flows of, of emotions and affects. So there's a way in which your affect is already being cellularly and molecularly inflected from within the algorithm so that then what is really really happening is, is really at the level of the unconscious. The unconscious becomes the factory that is being produced by the feedback, feedback loop of algorithms. That is the movement at the speed of light. So if I had to write Exhausting Dance again today, I would start thinking about no, not necessarily just tracking, you know, but this kind of infusion of systems of surveillance at the level of the unconscious and at the level of cellular desire. And then what happens in relationship to to movement and to dance, I think it's super, super, super interesting. Uh, there's a, a two, two dancers that I showed a little bit before, David Pontes and Wallace Ferreira. Because the thing, I wouldn't write about logisticality. I think it's still too kinetic to logisticality. is like, I think with the pandemic and with critical black studies, the great boom of critical black studies that happened also over these 15 years, with the work of uh, uh, Saidia Hartman and Fred Moulton, right? Michelle Wright, like all of these, uh, you know, Al Alex Wahelier. So all of these um, incredible philosophers in critical black studies, one of the things that I think they, and, and particularly Denise Ferreira da Silva, what happens is that what they're proposing is a fundamental transformation of, our no of this, the notion and science of physics. <laughs> 
and what's happening with the work, the choreography of David Pontes and Wallace Ferreira, with they have a, 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 a choreography that they did just recently during the pandemic, in which they take from the philosophy of Denise Ferreira da Silva the notion that time is that which is not, and they imagine a dance outside of the Newtonian and Einst even Einsteinian categories of time and space. It is amazing. <laughs> it is mind-blowing. It is both philosophical and scientific, metaphysical and enfleshed to a degree that you don't even know what it is. They call it delirium. Right? And as Deleuze and Gattari would say, every delirium is geographical political. And that's what they're doing with a radical transformation of the notion of physics, which is not metaphoric. It's a different kind of thing. So, um, so that's what I would, be, uh, no, if I had to write that book today, and I think Singularities does that somehow. Um, it gestures towards that, but now I, that's five years ago, so now I know more. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it helps. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I have some, maybe some comments about it, like, like one comment and one question which would maybe connect us to the, to the next question that I had in mind. Um, I like a comment when you said that actually uh, kin kinetic uh, like movement is still connecting connected with the idea of freedom, whatever the cost of the freedom is. And for me, it also has not only um, not it's not only related to pandemic, but also to the ecological problems, because like I'm based here in Finland and like all the discourse in arts is how we actually can afford this slow movement <laughs> and slow ontology um, because um, the our idea like our connection between movement and especially flying and uh, freedom is is suicidal <laughs> in ecological terms uh, that it just like exhausts the exhausts the planet but so, you see I, yeah I, I agree totally I totally agree, but I also feel like the U.S. military, the U.S. military, if it was a country, it would be the fifth most polluting country in the, in, in the planet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And then I think about what would happen if we'd have a world that didn't have the U.S. military and the Russian military and the Chinese military? Maybe... We could afford trouble. flying. <laughs> Maybe we could afford, you know, we artists, we the displaced, we the undercommons, like, could actually get out of the, of the confinement of the nation state that creates this catastrophe without shame. And then tell okay artists you know what just stay at home and be local okay. i find that shameful i understand you know and it's fine and you should be ethical and stay at home and be local that's i'm not saying not to do that but i think like there's more shame going on in different aspects of life in this shameful capitalists and that <laughs> i don't even want to go there you know like you know, the destruction of the of the Amazon forest to feed McDonald's and burgers and the and the and, and the production of soybeans. To, I mean it's like it's just it's just I think it's especially funny and shameful because the military like serves to kind of protect the borders of the national states though the capital uh, capitalism and all the struck infrastructures they are global and actually they mm -hmm. are going mm -hmm. uh, th they're going through these borders and they do not exist uh, exactly like, like exactly so so i don't know I I, I I i understand and i participate and i'm happy not to fly as much and You're all that critical about it <laughs> Yeah, it, it was just an example. Uh, no, 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 I totally, I'm totally cool with the example and I'm glad that you brought it and, and yes, also, <laughs> you know. I, I also would like to maybe try to move a little bit into the topic of effects. 
uh, but uh, put it a little bit uh, differently uh, coming back to to the project or to the mission of artists for which you were uh, for whom you were an advocate because uh, after their project a kind of a mission was described and theor theoretized kind of this notion of uh, conceptual dance or non-dance appeared and though everybody usually says that it's non-existent and nobody um, agrees that this turn is relevant and in any way it appears just maybe we need it just to understand what we are talking about and it appears also in books by theoreticians and this project of these particular artists if like though they are not a group and maybe they do not have a, a consistent <laughs> a consistent project but when it's captured in in, in a book like it, it appears like this um it like it was kind of either criticized later uh and like for, like for some reasons for being a little bit maybe didactic or being too uh concerned with language and like linguistic operations and like science and signification and stuff like that and also it feels that there have been this shift and you also mentioned it that now uh now you have to dance like crazy mm -hmm. and uh, i also remember for example the text by martin Sponberg also drawing this line between uh so-called conceptual dance and like between like this new dance which is coming uh after it and which is more concerned with somatics and movement research and uh, effects and also yeah also i don't know Bayana Svej was writing about it uh mm -hmm. talking about meta ingolson's work and, and and there are many other examples uh so but at the same time i see in your book that um there, maybe there is there there is no confrontation between these two projects or if there are two projects of the if there if this shift <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in missions even existed so i would like to ask your like about your opinion uh, if uh, if these artists you're writing about had a mission if this whether this mission is completed whether something else came <laughs> after it uh whether there was this shift or not um what's the what's the dynamics uh of of development of, of this project of the critical project which choreography is carried like carried in itself in uh, in the 90s and 2000s and having this uh, kind of historical distance now after like 20 years how do you see it like historically hmm. <laughs> your questions are amazing so um I think you're welcome. Um, I think that, in a way, I think. Okay, so to clarify, I don't think anywhere in the book I classify any of them as being non-dance or conceptual dance. I refuse both titles, and actually, I refuse classification. Only in a footnote. That's like you say that some critics uh, say that like that you'd call it like this right so i i mentioned that someone calls them like this but i don't call them like this and it's okay i, I mean because because it is important always to give an account to the singularity of the work uh, i think but together we can see that there are certain efforts being made differently by these different choreographers in a sense you know the question of the mission accomplished in a way, yes. I think that the main mission was to to really insist, because you see, like it is important histor like, okay, historically. <laughs> I think Nashton mentioned, you know, in the '90s you're too young. I was I was already like I don't know. I was in my 30s in the '90s. So so you know, I remember you know as an old man. You know, I remember, and I remember that dance studies and dance theory there's not not even such a thing it was not accepted it was not something to be thought about and if it was something to be thought about it was to reinforce again that same image of dance and to and to try to isolate purity somehow and to and to everything else was at the periphery so if there's something that was a, that they accomplished this generation in many many different ways was to really insist on 
the deep relationship between language and corporeality, and particularly of the performative speech act and corporeality, the performativity of language in way in which it creates behaviors, bodies, genders, identities, non-identities, so on and so forth, are made explicit in many of these dances. And that's why they had to use linguistic mechanisms. Language as intrinsic to choreographic imagination. Not necessarily to, to dance, for let's leave it, but it could be, but, so that was important. And that I think they accomplished. You know, and that's taken for granted, and that's great that we ar arrived at that moment. The other thing we talked about it uh, already, uh, it's uh, the Steel Act, so we talked about that. In terms of affect, um, oh, but then, you know, so, so in the development after the book was written, there's two, let's say, important waves that happen in, in experimental contemporary dance, whatever you want to call it, we can define it later. <laughs> One was all of a sudden like choreographers using things on stage. A lot of choreography with stuff on stage. And I remember giving a lecture in a, in a dance studies conference in which some professors were very impatient with my presentation because they were like, now there's no, no, so first the dancers stop dancing and now there's no dances anymore, it's just like objects. So I'm like, yes, but it's still choreographers wanting to do this. And there's a long history of that as well. Right. And then the dances in the dark, remember like dances in the dark, 2015 maybe, 10, 10, bunch of dances in the dark. Now we can't see, even see anymore. And what is this about? And it's still dance like Mette Edvardsen, Mette Edvardsen, like uh, uh, I, now I can't remember, like a bunch of other, uh, Manuel Palmos, like, like all of these dances in the dark. And those are still operating at the level of like, the, what are the constitutive elements of the choreographic? To think about photology, the love of light, that representation participates of, but also the love of light that advanced surveillance capitalism has. Right? Surveillance capitalism can only have at the moment in which light is captured and put it at the service of capital, either through fiber optics or through these mechanisms through which we are exchanging right now, in which I was listening to, to the radio the other day and someone was just saying, we just developed this app and we just captured 50 million eyeballs. <laughs> we captured 50 million eyeballs. What does it mean to capture an eyeball? That piece of, of, of the, our body that the Luz once so beautiful said, it is a machine in love with, with the sun. <laughs> now it's no longer a machine in love with the sun. It's actually a... Uh, 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 um, a pr prosthesis to photological capitalism, you know. So if if that happens, and we're operating at a level, if, if dance operates at the level of the somatic, then let me do a somatic experiment to create dances in absolute darkness. Of course, it makes total sense to be in the dark, to see darkness. I think it's beautiful. I don't know. Am I answering your question? Anna? I'm sure I'm not, but tell me that I'm not because then I can. You are kind of answering my question. <laughs> I yeah, I, I was. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about like the mission accomplished and uh, like what happened after that. Uh, so did uh -huh. it did it open like the the ways yep. for so something else to 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 happen more like less connected yeah. with yeah. linguistic yep. operations, but more um, yeah more connected with. Dance, dance with objects happen after. Dances in the dark happen after. And the way, a big wave of reenactments. The reenactment as a kind of ontological moment. So all of these come after the writing of Exhausting Dance. And I think those are three big waves in, in, in European and North America. Well, you know, experimental dance at large. The reenactment. Not but objects, also, but also ra maybe also raves and uh, dance like crazy trends. Totally, 
totally, you know. And I remember, like, you know, I remember, like, having a conversation with Martin Spomberg around that period. And I remember telling him, like, it was in a conference in Makba about expanded choreography. And I had just watched this amazing movie about Muhammad Ali. And, and there's, a, there's a fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. And George Foreman is just like in super shape. And Muhammad Ali is going to be destroyed. Like there's no reason. Like, but they, they ask Muhammad Ali like, so how are you going to win? And he says, I'm going to dance and I'll dance and I'll dance and I'll dance until he's on the floor. And that's exactly what he did, you know, before this hyper trained, hyper muscular perform hyper performance body, like he danced and he won. Uh, yeah, but I wonder how do you perceive this, uh, this change, maybe this shift into from um, the image of dance as uh, as uh, as um, what, oh, I forgot the word perpetual mo movement like a uh -huh. st uh -huh. stylized like like maybe this idea of a modern dance more uh, through this act of slowness and discovering the uh, connection between language and corporeality back mm -hmm. into like actually critical choreographers which are still critical but they, which are more uh concentrated on again <laughs> again moving crazily isn't is it like the going back or is it something else because i also remember uh i don't know i don't remember who wrote it but something like after after this like the, after the 90s uh, after this conceptual dance i'm sorry to, to using this term again uh mm -hmm. dance is kind of post conceptual it means that it can't be uh it if you want to uh make something you or like i don't know critical uh today you actually have to take into account the work of that those choreographers because uh if you want to like to put attention into somatics or into perpetual dance at the moment you also need to like somewhere on the base inside it has to take into consideration all these linguistic operations and all the mm -hmm. critic and the critical act which was uh accomplished in the 90s mm. well that anna i have to say that this is a moment that i think i would have a polite radical disagreement <laughs> because <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that uh, I'm not at all interested in, in, in formulations about what dancers and choreographers need to do and not need to do and what they need to have into account and don't have to need to have into account. I'm not interested in saying we are in a post-conceptual or pre-conceptual or para-conceptual movement. I'm interested the movement of unfolding and flourishing that happens constantly all the time through different generations and through different even if those generations are 90 years old it doesn't matter um, so I, for me it's your question is impossible to I cannot answer the question because the premises from which I depart are completely different I would never say to anyone in order for you to do this you need to do that So in order for a choreographer today to pay attention to the po to the con conceptual choreographer, whatever, like, I, I can't say that, I can't say that sentence. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's So like, I don't know if it's going back to the past or to the future yeah, or to the side, yeah. like, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very important. It's very important. It's not like, um, yeah, I, I just wonder. <laughs> um, I also had another question about this 15 years and the, like the Russian translation. Um, maybe I don't know what if we have enough time, but maybe it will be a last the last question. Mm -hmm. Because in exhausting dance, um, there is a topic about temporality and uh, colonialism 
and the idea of how Western culture and Western uh, art is treating non-Western cultures as lagging behind. So mm -hmm. they even can't have their ontology because it's not here, kind of, mm -hmm. yet. Um, and uh, like, how do you see this event of translation, this book 15 years after the original appeared in Russia, which is uh, kind of a non-Western <laughs> country. Well, it's not it's not Western Europe <laughs> for sure, at least. And uh, it is the so-called uh, Second World, which is uh, well, uh, one might say it's even more <laughs> invisible in this uh, talks about hierarchies and temporalities, because like if this like so-called third world <laughs> or uh, developing countries like they exist in this like post-colonial or decolonial discourse like the second world like it's something else something which is not uh yeah which, which is not <laughs> visible maybe so how do you how do you see how do you see this event uh, in this perspective <laughs> well, and are you saying that because it took 15 years to translate it's an indication there's a kind of belatedness yes 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 okay. yes i mean i mean i don't i don't say that it's true okay yeah something in the air yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. so no it's just it? to clarify first of all yes. so that it becomes clear to to the viewers to the listeners that you know um it's basically this this notion that appears uh, already in fanon but also Homi Baba, um, an important post-colonial critic, talks about this kind of what he calls a constitutive belatedness of the subaltern or colonial subject, right? Like the metropole or the center is always saying, you're a little bit behind, you're a little bit behind. And we see that happening also in the peripheries of Europe. Like, you know, in Portugal, it was very, very clear that, you know, like if whatever innovation would take place, it was already behind, even though like, so, so there's that, right? So that's what you're referring to. And of course, I'm not saying that that is a fact. I'm just saying that there's an accusation from the centers to say that you, you're always catching up, right? But it's also ah. it's also something that uh, a colonial subject experiencing. It's also the right. act of auto colonization, and it's very exactly present. exactly very present, right? So you know, to that I'll just say there's still no French translation. So <laughs> maybe they're more behind than they think they are. The center of Europe. I love the fact, but I love the fact that the translation, ex with the exception of, I guess, German, there's the, the, the translation of Exhausting Dance happens in the so-called peripheries. So that makes me think that there's something in that book that is relevant for the peripheric, for the eccentric. And the fact that there's a resonance with the eccentric ones, I love that. Yeah, that's great to be eccentric and <laughs> that's great joke about France. Thank you so much. Yeah, and in terms of references, I don't know if we can share, and maybe you share and I share mine. So one of the choices uh, of the book was this combination of uh, visual artists and um, choreographers and dance artists. Also, especially at this beginning, uh, that dance is not necessarily a mov movement perpetual movement it's like really very like whatever and i think like the case that you shared about the choreographers from brazil that it's like really um, uh even from my side of an institutional curator was really the fact that i needed to, that it's pronounced by someone else and is that it's written <laughs> and uh, that it has a lot of footnotes and you know like that it's there because I, I really think, uh, uh, and I'm sure that your book will influence a big bunch of Russian choreographers and performers and those who try to find themselves now as um, free artists using these um, limitations. I mean, like going over the limitations of genres and uh, 
uh, of areas of art so that I am sure that it will really be influencing and that's for example from our side of an institution was really trying to um, like among other choices because surely the gaps are so huge so we cannot publish everything yeah. and choosing so that was one of the intentions and i don't know what is anya's uh view in this case maybe you can share as well then we'll wrap up uh you are asking like i don't i, I don't get the i'm asking like because uh, andrea uh, said that uh, we like the centric that we find something resonate in this book and I shared what I find uh, reasonable and re re resonate resonating from my point of view uh, in terms of the Russian context maybe you share your your version mm. Mm. yeah I think um, for me it's a very important uh, like uh, it was a very important phrase that Andres said that he was looking for for a way to defend his friends <laughs> and to become an advocate for them mm -hmm. and i think that uh, uh yeah i think i was trying to do something something similar in, in my book like observing the experimental dance scene in in Moscow and St. Petersburg and it was like very like it was actually what I was trying to do this to explain that it's relevant to, uh, in some sense and I think this book does kind of the same for the local scene as well um, because it explains what are connections between like philosophy and cultural studies and choreography and dance which is still observed like and seen as something like more intuitive and maybe less intellectual also i think it's very important in russian context because uh like historically russian contemporary art is very text centric mm. because it's kind of afraid of and anything bodily because in russian history in soviet history it is very much connected with a uh, totalitarian history mm -hmm. and that's why like the roots of the russian contemporary art like which is which we have now it, it has its roots in russian uh, the art of the 70s which is very text centric and very suspicious of body and somatics huh, interesting and uh it's very important to publish a text where there is no contradiction between these two things where the body is seen like as a somat like somatic and semiotic at the same time yes. and the connection between these two things are explained so how language creates like corporeality and vice versa and also through mm -hmm. through performative acts through austin but also through the through effect and this theory of effects so i think yeah seen in this perspective it's it's kind of very important also to uh to to establish connection between visual arts and dance Be because like theaters in russia are still more i mean dance theaters are still more modern dance and belly oriented and actually contemporary like visual arts are the infrastructure for these new choreographers to do their work and to uh, mm -hmm. deliver it, just distribute it, and also they can find audience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and audience of the of the contemporary art museums. So I I would say that yeah, it's strategically it's important. As long as it works as a strategic thing, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. No. But there is a lot on you, so, <laughs> it's, so it's anyway. the book, you know, it's like sometimes I have to say, anyway, I shouldn't say this, but sometimes as the book just writes itself. I don't even know what I'm saying, you know, yeah. it just needs to be said. Fair enough. So thank you very, very much. And I'll just thank check you. if there is any question from the audience or oh. they would have to read the book. And so there are going to be more questions in a year. So I think that We'll check the chat. So there is everybody's everybody's mesmerized as far as I get it. So uh, we're gonna wrap up, and uh, uh, thank you very very much, uh, Andrea, for joining us, for finding time, and for sharing your views and uh, sharing the methodologies and like the story of the book. And so we're gonna read properly and uh, like expand our knowledge. Thank you, Anya, very much for joining us uh, from Helsinki and finding time also.
and or for what you do to connect different discourses, the local, now the, <laughs> the Finnish, <laughs> and then the international. And so we keep on uh, with Garage Life event, uh, events, and uh, we hope to see Andrea in Moscow in a year or, or something. So we'll do our best yeah. that it happens. And Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, because I think it's really important. So it's uh, and the talk will be translated into Russian and we'll keep on Garage YouTube. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, Nastya, and thank you, Anna, and thank you at the Garage. It, I have to say it's a great honor to be translated into such a beautiful language and particularly through Garage, which is such an important place that I'm, it's mythical, you're, you're, you don't, you should know that you are a mythical institution in, oh. the, in the world. <laughs> Thanks so, God, not ephemeral. <laughs> yes, but so it's a great honor and I say it uh, with, with, tr with, with, with my heart, really. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Have a, love, uh, have a nice, uh, yeah, still day. So we're going to sleep very <laughs> well. Okay. Uh, Good night. So Good see night. you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, we're wrapping up, yeah.